On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, two U.S. flagged ships of Maersk Lines Limited are targeted and attacked by the Houthi in the Gulf of Aden. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's episode. So today we witnessed a direct attack on U.S. flag vessels attempting to sail from the Gulf of Oman through the Gulf of Aden, through the Bab el Mandab into the Red Sea. These two ships are operated by Maersk Lines Limited. This is the American subsidiary of Maersk Lines in Denmark. We're going to talk about this and some issues associated with this attack and what is going on board U.S. vessels right now. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So the video you're seeing here is from a sister ship of the ships involved in the incident. This is from Brian Boyle's channel. Great channel. I'll have the link in the show notes if you want to see what life is like on board a ship. But this is the story from Mike Schuller over at G Captain today. Uh, Danish shipping giant AP Moeller confirmed in an incident involving two of its U.S. flag vessels, the Maersk Detroit and the Maersk Chesapeake. The two ships were part of a scheduled U.S. Navy quote-unquote accompaniment for a northbound transit of the Bab el Mandab today when they were reported seeing explosions close by. Story goes on, the United Kingdom's Maritime Trade Operations Office, which does not identify vessels in its alert, said it received a report from the master of a commercial vessel reporting an explosion 100 meters off the starboard side while approximately 50 miles south of Al Mukia, Yemen. The Maersk Detroit and Maersk Chesapeake are operated by Maersk Lines Limited, Maersk U.S. flag subsidiary. Both are enrolled in the U.S. Maritime Administration's Maritime Security Program and the Voluntary Intermodal Shipping Agreement. The statement from United States Central Command said this, On January 24th at approximately 2 p.m. Sana'a time, Iranian-backed Houthi terrorists fired three anti-ship ballistic missiles from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen toward the U.S. flag-owned and operated container ship MV Maersk Detroit, transitioning, uh, transiting the Gulf of Aden. One missile impacted in the sea. The two other missiles were successfully engaged and shot down by the USS Gravely DDG-107. There were no reported injuries or damage to the ship. Maersk went on to say that the cargo belonged to the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of State, U.S. AID, and other U.S. government agencies, and is therefore afforded the protection of the U.S. Navy for passage. Maersk Lines Limited went on to say, the safety of our crews are of utmost importance. We are developing network contingencies that will keep us informed. So let's talk about this and what exactly was happening and transpiring here. Because while we got information from Maersk Lines Limited, we got information from U.S. Central Command, we didn't get all of them information. I'm going to tell you that right now. Because my channel affords me the ability to talk directly to mariners who are either out there or sailing in and around the area. And my experience of having been a merchant mariner, having sailed uh, for, a merchant, for the Merchant Marine and attending one of the six state maritime academies, really gives me the opportunity to talk to mariners on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's go over a couple of things first. Ships are being attacked, and while no ship has been sunk and no crew member has been killed or wounded, that does not minimize the danger involved. So this image, which was put together by H.I. Sutton over at Covert Shores, is a still of the attack on motor vessel Zagrafia. Zagrafia was a U.S.-owned but Marshall Island-flagged bulk carrier. And here you can see the moment that what looks like an Iranian Fatah 313 or an Asaf missile shot by the Houthis. Not Iranian, it's not Iran that was shooting this, it was, it, was, it was shot by the Houthi. But here you can see that missile coming down and hitting the number two hatch. Here you see the moment of the explosion. Now, I will say that that explosion does not appear to be the warhead detonating. If you look at a Fatah 313, it can carry a warhead up to 800 pounds. This looks more like the fuel from the missile exploding vice the actual missile itself detonating. This is the ship came into the Suez shipyard just the other day, so we have images of it. The missile came in here through the number two hatch. So this is a big, huge bulk carrier. It was sailing from Vietnam to Europe, and you'll notice it's in a light condition. It's, it's empty. These big hatches, this is number one hold, this is number two hold, carry grain, rice, whatever you need in there, or whatever needs to be carried. 
So the missile came down here at about a 45 degree angle. And here from the other side, you can see how light the vessel is. We believe the missile exited, or at least the warhead came out this side. You can see how the metal is peeled out here off the port side, pretty low on the vessel. So ships are being hit. It is just fortunate that we have not seen a vessel hit to a sufficient degree to catch fire and be lost or for any of the crews to be killed or wounded, which is a significant element. The other element you have here is how Operation Prosperity Guardian is operating. The U.S. Navy, along with the British Navy, the Royal Navy, are using their warships, roughly about four Arleigh Burke class destroyers and one Type 45 class destroyer of the Royal Navy to provide safeguard against missiles and drones being launched, which means that you are basically putting these ships along the coast of Yemen, between Yemen and the main shipping channel. And understand that area has increased. The initial shipping target area was down here, the very southern end of the Red Sea, but now is extended out into the Gulf of Aden. And while many ships have diverted, at least 30% of all ships normally sailing through here have diverted, and 50% of the tonnage has diverted the large container liners. Not all container liners are diverted. These are the tracks of seven ships of CMA CGM line. This is the national shipping line of France. And the French have been providing direct escort for their vessels. This is an image of a French frigate escorting two such ships. Up forward is a CMA CGM ship and then aft is an APL. This is a subsidiary of CMA CGM. And the reason they can do direct escorts is the French frigate here provides point defense. In the distance is the U.S. Navy destroyers and the Royal Navy destroyer providing that protection. U.S. ships sailing through the area, and we've seen this happen before, the January 9th attack, where four U.S. ships were coming southbound in the Suez, uh, southbound from Suez. They were coming through the Red Sea, and we have that big, huge, massive attack that stages the 22 missiles and drones that were shot. Those ships were not directly escorted. They were screened by the U.S. Navy and screened very well. But there was not a ship riding shotgun on them, at least not a U.S. Navy ship riding shotgun on them. The attack that took place today on Maersk Detroit and Maersk Chesapeake, while they said that there was accompaniment, they were not escorted directly by a U.S. Navy vessel. There was no U.S. Navy vessel alongside them. And again, you don't always need that. There could be air cover provided by FA-18s off the USS Eisenhower. There could be drones. There could be Air Force uh, aircraft staging from an air base ne nearby. But there was not a direct escort of the ships going by. And understand the attack on Maersk Detroit and Maersk Chesapeake was sufficient enough that the crews were sent down into what's called the Citadel. This is an area of the ship in the deep in the interior of the vessel so that if they get hit by a missile or a bomb that they're shielded from the explosion because right now the big danger is getting wounded by these explosions. They're down there. Now if the ship sinks it's a whole problem you got to get out. But they're down there and this explosions was enough and the near misses were enough to lead these sh two ships being uh, forced to return. So this is marine traffic, and I'm going to give you a couple of caveats here on marine traffic. A lot of the images you're seeing here, of these are all just U.S. flag ships. A lot of them are very dated because the U.S. flag ships have turned off their AIS. So let me make a couple of points here. Ocean Jazz. This is Ocean Jazz. It was a subject of an attack day before yesterday. Ocean Jazz was sailing southbound when it was attacked. Now, the U.S. came out and said the Ocean Jazz was not attacked. It was. It was the subject of an attack. It was not physically attacked in that missiles exploded close by, but it was targeted by the Houthi. Here is Maersk Detroit. Here is Maersk Chesapeake. Both those vessels were waiting out here at the meeting point, and this is where those embarked crews come on board. Maersk Detroit and Chesapeake were told to hang here and wait, and then they were ordered to go ahead and sail through. And what we heard come in was the report of an attack. This is from the United Kingdom's MTO. Uh, they received a report of an incident 50 nautical miles south of Al Malka, Yemen. Uh, Master reports an explosion approximately 100 meters from the vessel on its starboard side, exactly what we heard reported by Maersk Detroit. Vessel and crew are safe, no injuries or damage reported. Vessels are advised to transit with caution, report any suspicious activity. So the ships got to this point right here, and then they were forced to turn around. 
So, and this point is the narrowest when you come in here past the island of Purim and into this area. This was the area of a lot of attacks we saw recently. And so it looks like Maersk Detroit, Maersk Chesapeake were, were right in that area when they were told to turn back. I want to talk about another issue here that's equally important about this. U.S. vessels are being specifically targeted. So the Houthi are ratcheting up that. There are reports over and over again about crews getting paid extra money for sailing through. Showed you reports all on GCAP and I'll have them in the show notes of foreign crews getting money, Danish crews getting double wages, who's not getting paid right now, war bonuses or war zone pay or danger pay, whatever you want to call it, is U.S. crews. They're not getting paid this. Let me be clear about something. If the Houthi fired at commercial airliners overhead, that would be story number one. It would displace everything else in the news. However, shooting at U.S. flagships gets almost no attention whatsoever. And the crews on these ships are doing their job, and they're not being paid by the companies. And it's the companies that aren't doing that. Understand the unions are going to bat for them. This is one of the reasons why there are maritime unions, because mariners will be screwed by operating companies consistently. And right now, I know, I know for a fact that the unions are talking to Maersk Lines Limited about this. Now, Maersk Lines Limited's retort to this is that we're operating on thin margins, we don't have the money, and this is not our war. You're signed on to sail through this area, and therefore you will sign on. Now, let me be clear. If Maersk Lines starts to, <clears throat> I don't know, threaten their crew members, with black marks or blacklisting them if they walk off because they're not getting paid, that's going to be a problem. There's going to be a huge problem right there because, number one, you cannot ask mariners to sail into war zones of danger if they're not being provided with enough protection. Understand, these ships have private security detachments on board. They don't even have U.S. Marines. Story a couple of months ago about putting U.S. Marines on board foreign flag tankers sailing through the Straits of Hormuz for companies like BP and Chevron for fear that their tankers were going to get grabbed by the Iranians. So the U.S. Marines practiced the Bataan Amphibious Group, which is up in the mid right now, trained to break their, mar their Marines up into small detachments, put them on ships to provide security. We're not doing that right now. Now, understand, we did that during the, Pers during the uh, Iraq War in 2003. We activated the 92nd uh, Infantry Brigade out of Puerto Rico, National Guard, broke them up into 13-person detachments, Operation uh, Guardian Mariner, and we put security detachments on them along with later on Marines and elements of the fleet anti-terrorism uh, security teams. We're not doing that right now. So right now, these companies are hiring private uh, security guards to defend themselves against helicopter, small boat, and drone attacks. That does nothing to protect them against ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. That's what the Navy's there for. But the fact that they can't get a destroyer running roughshod on them, you know, hurting them, is a problem. And let me be clear, this is not on the U.S. Navy. I am not picking on the Navy here. The Navy is doing stellar work. Every mariner I talk to says this over and over again, and I heard it again from the attack on these ships. Hey, the Navy saved our ass. So kudos, bravo Zulu, to the U.S. Navy, to Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, the Fifth Fleet, the Combined Maritime Force, Operation Prosperity Guardian. You are doing a stellar bang-up job. Same thing with the drone operators out of Djibouti and whatever Air Force assets are in theater there, along with the crews on... USS Eisenhower, the F-18s, and all the support crews on there are doing a great job. What I'm talking about here is we don't have the assets. We have fundamentally screwed ourselves over the past 20 years. The French, the Italians have these frigates. They're great. You want a frigate riding rough shot? We don't have that because we built littoral combat ships, which were built to combat in the littoral. Well, guess what? This right here, this is the friggin' littoral. They were designed to deal with groups like the Houthi, not a peer-to-peer -peer threat like the Chinese. But guess what? Littoral combat ships don't work. They don't work well, let's put it that way. I think there's a lot of utility in littoral combat ships. I think we should make them work. I don't think we should be scrapping them eight years after they're built. I think that's a fundamental issue because it's going to be till 2030 that we see the first Constellation class come in. The other issue here that I, I have a huge amount of problems with is why is the Maritime Administration not going to bat for these ships and the crews? The U.S. Maritime Administration is supposed to be the advocate for the U.S. Merchant Marine. They should be in there 
brokering whatever's going on between the union, the shipping company, and those crews. They should be in there full front. They should be in there talking to the Navy to ensure there's adequate protection for these ships. And I know the Navy's trying to provide whatever protection they can. And when I say the Navy, I'm not talking about Fifth Fleet. I'm not talking about the, the, the destroyers out there that are doing great jobs. I'm talking about back in D.C. at the Pentagon, at Central Command, at the Joint Chiefs of Staff level, and in the friggin' White House talking about this, because that's who needs to be talked to. Why are we not providing protection? You're talking about a handful of destroyers. Handful, four maybe, are really carrying that load along with allied ships. There needs to be more. Understand, the Houthi have done something unheard of they have interdicted 11% of the world trade and they're forcing it to go around Africa. You've got to go back to the world wars to find a naval power that emerges that makes trade lanes bend and interdict supplies. That's what the Houthi have done. And they're doing it with Iranian hand-me-down missiles duct taped together, cobbled together, and being launched and hitting. And the, the, the only thing that's been the saving grace here is that the missiles are so crappy that they don't blow up like they're supposed to. Understand, this will not last long because what's going to begin to happen is once there's a realization that the Houthi are not either not hitting or they're not damaging the ships enough, then you'll see a resumption of trade back through this area, which means the Houthi will ramp it up again and they will try to sink and kill crew members on board. Understand, I don't think they're doing this consciously right now. Some people are saying, well, the Houthi are not trying to hurt anybody. No, that's not what they're doing. It's just the missiles aren't that great. If they see the potential here, then they will do it. Understand, this is a targeted attack against the United States of America. That's what they did when they targeted U.S. ships. This led to our entry into World War friggin' one. This is the whole reason we got in is because they were targeting U.S. flagged vessels. We saw it on January 9th. We saw it again with the Ocean Jazz, and now we're seeing it again with the attack on Maersk Chesapeake and Maersk Detroit. And we need to react to that. And the, let me be clear here. The answer isn't just bomb the Houthi more. It's not land Marines into Yemen, because that is a whole mess of an issue. You've got to defuse this issue. That means diplomacy, that means their statecraft, but it also means we have to make it so that the ships sailing through are not being subjected to attack, and that means more defense when it comes to the vessels. It is very dangerous to get sucked into one of these conflicts, and all of a sudden it becomes a bigger, bigger conflict because now you've got to go ashore. As I said in a video not too long ago when I compared what the Houthi are doing to what we did in the first Barbary War, understand the way we ended the first Barbary War was by paying off the Tripolitans. The way we ended the second Barbary War was by use of overwhelming force against them with not just us but the british and the french and eventually what really ended it was the french taking over algiers that's what eventually ended it and i'm not advocating that at all but you have to understand you have to go at this with more than just one avenue of of, of attack you can't just be using the military hammer you have to be using diplomacy you have to be looking at what you can do behind the the scenes i think the british were trying to negotiate with the iranians try to get the iranians to make movements against the houthi you just saw a thing come out where the state department saying maybe the chinese can use movement for this i'm not sure i'm not sure any of those will work in any way what i do know is we waited too long we allowed the houthi to gain momentum and we haven't been able to squelch this and the problem is you can bomb the Houthi until the end of time, because the Saudis did it for 10 years. You're not going to eliminate them with, with air power. You're just not. And while air power has its huge advocates, and I hear them all the time on my, on my Twitter and, and, and my email, this is not what's going to be the issue here. But U.S. vessels were attacked. U.S. crews were subjected to attack. And the fact that we're treating them poorly, and I mean poorly by not providing them direct escort by sending them into areas without secure communication. Did a whole video talking about the fact that there's no secure comms on the vessel. And once again, we sent crews into this area without secure comms. How is there not a Navy detachment on board there with secure comms? How is there is not Marines on board there with 50 caliber machine guns and Stinger missiles to shoot down drones or any small craft that comes on board? Yeah, I know they can't shoot down anti-ship cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. That's what the Navy destroyers and aircraft are there for. But you can provide that defense that Maersk Hangzhou, uh, one of the main Maersk Lines vessels, encountered back on New Year's. 
this is what we're not doing and we need to do it. And I know I'm on my soapbox again today and I said I wasn't going to do it, but this just pisses me off. And I'm telling you, there are a lot of people who are doing this wrong. Unions, shipping companies, Marad, you got to get out and talk about this. This needs to be discussed. We need to be shouting this from the rooftop and we're not. And instead, what we're doing is we're thinking everything is fine, everything is good. I'm not seeing an increase in my costs right now because, in truth, what's going to hit us is on the way. It's just a matter of time to let supply chain disruption hits us. (sighs) Sorry. I know I said I wasn't going to do it, but I went ahead and did it again. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I sure the heck didn't. (sighs) If you did, hey. How about subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as it comes out. Give it a big thumbs up, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? Well, pay some more risk bonus to the uh, crews who are risking their lives to return empty containers and, and refrigerated containers for the benefit of Maersk lines. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're doing. They're, 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 they're literally risking their lives to move empty containers and empty reefer refrigerated containers so that Maersk Lines, and I'm not talking about Maersk Lines Limited, I'm talking about the big Maersk company over in De- Denmark, can get those boxes where they want them because that's what the ships are full of because these are ships on the return route. They aren't even going to the Middle East. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's really discouraging when you're risking your life for that. <sighs> Support the page by hitting the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you become a monthly yearly subscriber. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.